very warm welcome to you all. Uh, this, I think, is a very going to be a very exciting evening for the Royal Asiatic Society. I'm I'm on the bottom line there. I'm Gordon Johnson, and I'm uh, at the moment I'm the vice president of the society. So it falls to me to welcome uh, you all. And I think we have a very large number of people uh, joining us by Zoom. Um, if you are joining us by Zoom, can I ask you to use the chat facility to uh, enter any questions or comments that you'd like to make, because you will be muted the whole time, whether you want to be or not. Um, and we are going to have uh, the, the, the running order uh, is as follows. We have these three very distinguished historians here, and I find them a very interesting group, and particularly because they're an interesting group that one wouldn't necessarily think would be interested in India. We've got on the far end, Professor Margot Finn. <laughs> on, 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 on the far, <laughs> Professor Margot Finn, who is, a, is at UCL, and she is an extraordinarily distinguished historian of culture and family and society in 18th century very mainline British uh, history. Next to her is the Young Turk. This is uh, this is Josh, your, um, uh, who's just written this wonderful book on the East India Company uh, and politics. And on his left is Philip Stern, who in 2011 uh, produced a wonderful book about the East India Company. Now, the thing about the two guys is that they work in really, that their intellectual background is in one of the uh, more difficult areas of history, in that they are interested in ideas and in political philosophy uh, and its application to studying history. And it must be confessed that uh, India, or South Asian history, has not had an input from that sort of intellectual uh, rigour really since Eric Stokes's wonderful book, The English Utilitarians and India, that was published in 1959. And of course, Eric Stokes came out of a generation that was influenced by Michael Oakeshott and Herbert Butterfield. And so I really feel that Indian history is finally becoming really mainstream because we have a mainstream British 18th century historian and two historians uh, who are coming out of this very uh, interesting intellectual uh, tradition. And the three books that you see uh, are advertised on, on the screen um, are all, they're all a terrifically good read. The, um, the East India Company at home, of course, you can look at free uh, if you go to the right bit of the UCL uh, website. The others, though, are worth every penny of the large <laughs> of the large sum they're being set, marketed at um, by Cambridge and by Harvard. Although, as you might expect, Harvard is cheaper than Cambridge. <laughs> so, anyway. What's going to happen is as follows. Um, the three of them are going to speak separately uh, about their work and their new research. And then when we come to the end of that part of the, uh, of the discussion there, we're, we're going to have a panel discussion. And then if we have time, we may take uh, the odd question or comment from within the room or from the Zoom. But I want to tell you that we are going to bring the shutters down very promptly at quarter to eight, so that there will be time for you to do some mingling and getting at the, the our three panelists uh, independently uh, while uh, while you have a drink. So we're going to start with Philip Stern, and then we're going to have uh, Joshua uh, Ehrlich, and then we're going to have Margot Finn. So there's nothing you need do now except sit back and enjoy 
the evening. Philip, would you like to start? Well, thank you, Gordon. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I happy to say I agree with everything you said, especially about the book being worth every penny. So, you know, um, but Josh's is worth worth a lot more. Um, I want to thank uh, thank you, Gordon, Allison, Maddie, and especially also Josh, who was uh, sort of the brains behind this this event. I think it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to have a conversation about what has been an evolving and changing field. I'm not sure I've ever been accused of being mainstream. Well, I appreciate it. Um, the um, I'm an odd person to start off this conversation, I think, uh, in the sense that uh, I'm so mainstream, I suppose, that I'm, I've actually written a book. I'm just going to make sure that I, um, that I have my timer on so I don't overstay my welcome. Um, that if I'm here to talk a little bit about new histories of the East India Company, having just published a book that's actually not about the East India Company. And uh, so I thought I would do what I would do in the time I've got uh, with you tonight is to talk a little bit about how this book, which is about the history of corporations and their role in shaping the global British empire from the 16th to 20th centuries, actually emerged out of my interest in understanding and work on the East India Company. And then maybe to tell you a little bit about what I think the implications about the East India Company, which is does play a, a large role in the book. To be fair, what the implications of the work I've done is on the East India Company, maybe how it fits into conversations I see as sort of emerging in, in the field in the last decade or so. Uh, so as, as a, a, a Gordon very generously mentioned, uh, about a decade and some ago, I published a book called The Company State, uh, which was a history of the East India Company uh, for, say, the first century and a half from 1600 to, to, to the middle of the 18th century. And that book grew out of a set of questions uh, and historiographical concerns that I had about with the way in which we had sort of approached the perplexing question of how a company came to be the government of a colonial empire in India. And um, probably everyone in this room will be fairly bored and familiar with the story I'm about to tell, but the the narrative that sort of had troubled me when I first encountered it as a, as a student was this idea that the East India Company had been a commercial body, a trading enterprise that somehow mysteriously, suddenly, and uh, in, in by many accounts, uh, in the phrase of, of, of the late 19th century imperial historian John Seeley, in a fit of absence of mind, had converted in the middle of the 18th century around the Battle of Plassey and the acceptance of the Devani in 1765 from a merchant to a sovereign, as people would have put in the 18th century. And as I sort of looked at that question with that book, it's argues and maintains is that the reason that we might think about that transformation as not being so sudden or accidental or absent-minded is that the East India Company had actually been a form of governance or a political body since its founding in 1600. And the arguments I made there, there are several, I don't have a lot of time to, to spend on them today, but uh, uh, you know, I'll mention three ways in which I think that that uh, that, the, that we might see the transition of the company as becoming a large-scale territorial power in the middle of the 18th century, which I think is a massive transformation and, and, and a shift of sorts, was enabled by its history in the first half of its lifespan uh, from 1600 to the 1750s. One argument I make in there, one point, is that commerce was never just commerce. There was no place in which trade, especially in the world outside of Europe, what did not involve politics in some way, diplomacy, uh, warfare, uh, the institutions of governance, both over your own people and then ultimately over uh, other peoples with whom you encountered, whether they were sailors on ships or other traders. This morphed in the East India Company by the time you get as early as the 1630s into the establishment of actual forms of governance over localized but nonetheless territorial sites, Madras first, then places like Bombay and Calcutta, as well as Benkulu and Sumatra, Cuddalore, Fort St. David, and other places around South Asia through into the early 18th century. So in order to enable this commerce, or as a function of this commerce, the East India Company both conceived of itself as a government and also asserted institutions of governance that laid the groundwork for the foundation for the British Empire that followed, if for no other reason than its three major fortified uh, urban sites of what they thought of as colonies, as well as trading factories, became the backbone of British India in the 18th and 19th century, Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta. The second point that I would make 
in relation to the sort of the, the, in that book about the way the East India Company sort of emerged as a uh, a form of political body is that we had long misunderstood it, I think, as a body that existed up until the 18th century as a as sort of emanating and emerging from English or British forms of sovereignty or British forms of, of, of polity. But what I tried to trace in that book were the ways in which the company was deeply reliant on and embedded in Mughal and other Asian forms of sovereignty in order to establish its authority, both over commercial enterprises like, say, freedom or liberty from taxation, but also over extra, juris extra jurisdictional uh, control over people, uh, especially in its fight against interlopers or those who would sort of Im impinge on its monopoly. So the, when the East India Company came to govern over Bengal after 1765, it did so not in the name of the British crown, but in the name of the Mughal emperor as the Divan of Bengal, Bihar and Ursa. And so as a result, that, um, that transformation had ground laid for it for decades, if not a century, by the company attempting to acquire Farmans and other forms of South Asian uh, and Mughal forms of sovereignty as a way of building its authority both over its own people and other people under its governance. And so that was another form in which the transition might be seen as a, as, a, as, a, as a gradual transformation rather than a sudden revolution. But the third way in which the East India Company, I would say, was political from its outset was the fact that it was a corporation. As a corporation, it was a, for, a, a legal form uh, and an entity, an institution that was embedded in ideologies and legal uh, traditions that went back to the medieval period and that had been created not for commercial purposes. I mean, today it might be the most immediate way in which we think about a corporation might very well be uh, as a sort of capitalist commercial enterprise, but it's really rooted in medieval forms of governance and ways of negotiating layered forms of sovereignty that emerged out of the medieval church and also out of uh, uh, medieval empires particularly the Holy Roman Empire, and, and notions of, um, of, of urban governance, right? So the Corporation of London is as much a model as, as a commercial corporation when the East India Company is established in 1600. So when I finished that book, and it gets me onto the new work, when I finished that book, uh, I started having um, uh, some, uh, what I might think of as a, a, a cognitive break of sorts. I, I, I was having a... a, a, um, a problem in that in that phenomenon you might have experienced it where you know you learn a new word and somehow you've never known that word before and then all of a sudden you see that word everywhere well for the next decade or so all i saw were corporations everywhere I, it was like a fever dream and i had um uh, uh to the point where you know i might have required hospitalization and the, it, i was it became upset but what i really started to notice was the that the argument i made specifically about the east india company was both broader and more complicated than the one I had made with the East India Company, that in fact underlying the British Empire from its very origins, from um, the Muscovy Company and other enterprises in the 16th century through to decolonization and after in the middle and late 20th century, corporations and joint stock companies, and there's a distinction I make in the book, which we can talk about later if anybody wants to ask about, uh, were fundamental to the making of the British Empire. They were not exclusive. There were lots of other forms. But the book that I sort of emerged that I ended up focusing on was a way of thinking about how the corporation and the joint stock company and their ultimate fusion to the joint stock corporation were really critical in doing a number of things that enabled both the expansion of forms of governance that were not the state in empire, much like the East India Company, and also much like the East India Company, the ways in which much a lot of the thing we might think of as the formal British empire, that which is run by the the state, the British state, in fact, was not created by the British state directly, but somehow absorbed, or if you want to say incorporated, from these enterprises that were originally what we might think of as private enterprise or forms of corporate body, both in the Atlantic world as well as in Asia and elsewhere. So in this book, I um, you know, trace this history uh, across from the 16th to the 20th centuries trying to make a point about how we might think about in a similar way that I talked about in the company state, think about the British empire as connected across the centuries rather than falling into old habits of thinking about there being a say first and second British empire or an earlier or later British empire or an Atlantic and Asian or Indian ocean British empire, but rather there are connections uh, uh, across those spaces, both ideologically and institutionally uh, that we can see in kind of iterative development of imperial forms. 
That also, one of the other issues that I deal with in this book is how history is absolutely critical to the making of empire. So the way in which the British Empire told, uh, the way in which some of these corporations and other entities told the story of their own, uh, justified or told the story of their own creation and their uh, and made the case for their own rights and privileges was one that always was embedded in a story about the British Empire being one that was rooted in, not in the state but in private enterprise. Going back to you know, uh, you have you have uh, uh, corporate or joint stock enterprises that trace this back to Strongbow and the colonization of Ireland under Henry II in the 12th century. You have arguments that trace it back to Columbus and conquistadors and the sort of Spanish models, all of which kind of make a case that it's really not the state that's best done, that empire is not necessarily best done by the state and more nuanced and complicated than that. But those are the kinds of ideas that I think that I sort of pull through in the book. Along the way, I make a number of other points about the importance of debt rather than finance, rather than, you know, uh, than credit in making, uh, uh, in, what, in making the empire happen. The joint stock companies enabled the ability to essentially uh, create an empire that might at times look like a multi-level marketing scheme, uh, that joint stock corporations had a capacity for in, uh, embedding property and, uh, and carrying it over generations and actually transforming sovereign rights into property rights and back again that, that, that were enabled by the particular structures of what a corporation was. And again, this idea about history and the ways in which by the time you get to the 19th and 20th centuries, you really start to see an emerging ideology among these corporate empires, these corporations attempting to sort of expand throughout uh, throughout the world, that pull back on a number of these 17th and 18th century traditions, including quite prominently the East India Company. And so the East India Company becomes an extremely formative um, uh, form of empire, even as it's being critiqued and its autonomy is being eroded between, say, the 1750s and its ultimate removal from government of India in 1858. Even after 1858, the East India Company becomes a live model and exemplar in places like Borneo and Africa and uh, South America for, new, for a new generation of corporate empires after supposedly it had become a form of empire that we had done away with, a form of empire that was supposedly um, uh, early modern, that was supposedly antiquated, was uh, out of time, as some people would have put it, the time as critics would have put it at the time. So in that sense, the East India Company lives on even after it's removed from power in the 1850s as a way of sort of generating empire, uh, even in its in its demise. So that leads me, I guess, in conclusion, uh, to just say a couple of things about this book, which traces all across the globe uh, uh, from, uh, from Russia to Patagonia uh, and traces this phenomenon in and out. Um, what, it, what, what can this sort of global history and thinking about the East India Company in this broader context do for thinking about what new histories of empire, uh, new histories of the East India Company might look like? Well, the first is the one I already mentioned, which is to see how the East India Company as a model, uh, as well as an anti-model, uh, transcended time and place. Everything was a new East India Company in the late 19th century, both for better uh, or for worse. Um, you also see evidence of the continuation of the East India Company as a form of lament. One of the most famous uh, uh, mouthpieces of this would be someone like John Stuart Mill, who continued for de for decades after the company's were from power to articulate a lament that the that the that the British state had essentially undermined the one institution that could could, could uh, more most effectively produce empire for a variety of reasons, which I can get into later as well. That said, I also would want to make the case, and I do make, hopefully make the case in this book, that we make a mistake when we undertake histories of the East India Company and only think about the East India Company as an isolated or a kind of um, uh, uh, um, singular phenomenon. There are ways in which a lot of East India Company histories tend to focus simply on the East India Company or, or the East India Company or the history of British India overshadows the global imperial context and the transperiod context in which empire had occurred. And so one of the arguments I might make that we think about tonight and we think about as we move forward is how the East India Company is embedded in histories that transcend, say, the Indian Ocean and Atlantic, as I sort of argued in my previous book, or histories that go back in time and forward in time, even past the East India Company's um, removal from power, one which is, in a sense, continues to today, as the East India Company itself, as many of you may have uh, darkened the doors of its the East India Company shop uh, off of Oxford Street, has come back to us as a form of remembering and a form of, of capitalism both uh, together. 
And the third and final way in which I think we might take from thinking about the East India Company, the context of the scores, I think there might be 400 something corporations or something in my book, and I forgot a whole bunch of them by the time the publication date rolled around. Um, what, what it means to think about the East India Company in this context is to think about this broader ecology um, and the ways in which that might help us to think about the analogies that are rife today between the East India Company and modern corporations. I once wrote a piece where I tried to trace through the news and I might've come up with about 45 things that within a two year span had been called the new East India Company in some media outlet or another. I don't actually think that's a bad, I actually think it's very helpful to think about this history as a way of thinking about the fundamental point I'm trying to make in this work, which is to decenter our understanding of the, as a, of the state as the only place in which governance happens. So the analogies between modern corporations of the East India Company may have flaws. There may be disconnects. We may think Google has an army, but it does not, right? There are very different ways in which these very different corporations in different contexts have to be approached. But in the way we might think and use history to understand that where political power and governance is situated is historically produced and did not, in a sense, close down the possibilities of non-state forms of governance in the middle of the 19th century when, when the apotheosis of a kind of status, singular statist ideology kind of emerges, although I, I don't know if I even stand by that argument that that's when it emerges. This history could help us to think about the present through the past as a way of understanding uh, forms of power as well as forms of, of, uh, uh, of neocolonialism in certain ways, as long as we understand that it, these arguments are best thought of more through genealogy than through analogy as well. So finally, I think the ways in which this might be embedded in uh, you know, larger literatures and conversations beyond what I'm interested in is I think we're seeing histories in, of the East India Company in three different forms. And I'll just mention them briefly and I can elaborate them on, on them in the discussion. One is understanding the East India Company as produced and contextualized within Mughal sovereignty and forms of Asian sovereignty rather than just British sovereignty. And I think one of the best examples of this is Robert Travers's new book, Embers of Complaints, right? One of those. Second, uh, a revival of interest that was extremely popular in the late 19th and early 20th century in the early East India Company that has now seen a kind of um, renewal or revival, understanding that the 17th century East India Company is, is, is deeply relevant to understanding the 18th and 19th, 18th, 19th and 20th centuries in, 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 in India. Um, and then finally, histories of failure and, and contingency, that we can look at some of these early companies um, uh, and early periods of the company and in ways in which it didn't actually understand itself as, being, as becoming an empire uh, in the 17th century in the way that it becomes in the 18th and 19th centuries, but that those, those, those histories of, uh, of, of failures, of, 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 of impediments and, and obstacles, such as we see, say, in, in Nandini Das's new book on Thomas Rowe, uh, or we see in, um, uh, in Alison Games's recent book on, uh, on Amboina, are actually constitutive of the making of empire. And that I also think has become a new trend in thinking about the East India Company, not as a, as a sort of progressive or linear path towards empire, but one that happens in fits and starts with many twists and turns and many obstacles in the way, um, and as myself being an obstacle in the way for uh, for, for our next guest, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to them. But thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Philip. Of course, there is a very general point here about the way in which corporations make states and the, relation, the, the dynamic between you know, the crown and the privileged bodies that legal structures that are negotiated between private enterprise and the crown or private enterprise and the state uh, uh, give us a, a new way of thinking about, uh, about politics and about how power is really uh, not something simple that's handed down and it's not something simple that grows up from beneath, but is, an inter is a genuine sort of uh, interaction between the two with all the, uh, the fun uh, successes and failures and conflict that that involved. Now, Joshua, are you ready to, uh, are you ready to take the stand? Please. Yeah. 
Thanks very much. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, thanks, uh, Allison and, and Gordon, for the kind introduction, and Margot, and perhaps especially Phil, who's done a lot of the explanation that I otherwise would have had to do to set up my book and my intervention in the history of the East India Company. Uh, as I think you're going to see, I'm building quite a lot on this line of research into the company and its dual character, its hybrid constitution as a company and state. Uh, what I'm adding, hopefully, is a consideration of that alongside the company's engagements with knowledge and really looking at how these engagements with knowledge from building universities to sponsoring scientific research uh, were used to justify this dual character under increasingly difficult circumstances in the later phase of the company's existence, the late 18th to mid 19th century. So I'm going to try to talk about why it's interesting to look at the history of the company and knowledge and how, in fact, this opens up other possibilities for thinking about the politics of knowledge um, and particularly the history of ideas of knowledge as a way of dealing with the politics of knowledge past, present, and future. So I have a few kind of starting propositions um, that shaped my approach as I developed it and articulated it in this book. I started very much influenced by the work of Phil and others, taking seriously the company's hybrid constitution as a company and state, even in this later period when, in older tellings, the corporate, the commercial role of the company had fallen away and left it simply as a government. Well, I think this dual character continues to matter. And in a way, it's the other side of the coin to, to Phil's argument about the early period when both politics and trade, both government and commerce matter. I think this continues to happen after the watershed moment of 1757, after the company is expanding territorially and losing trading rights. It still retains this dual constitutions, dual character. Another proposition is that we have to examine how the company justified that dual constitution, that dual character. In other words, it's ideology, uh, with ideology understood simply as a language of politics deployed to legitimate political action. And perhaps taking a, a departure away from existing work that had been kind of building up these propositions, I focused on ideas about knowledge and how really there was a politics of knowledge that the company was engaged in, a changing politics of knowledge. So my approach really has been defined by trying to integrate the history of knowledge with the history of political thought. If knowledge is power as the aphorism goes, then it would seem to follow that knowledge is political. But the history of knowledge has not really been concerned with political thought. I'll talk more about how it's developed from fields like social history, cultural history, uh, as a history of structures of knowledge, not ideas of knowledge. And at the same time, the history of political thought has not really been concerned with knowledge. Um, it's been concerned perhaps with certain branches of knowledge, but not with knowledge as a overriding, as a, as a broad category. And this leads to my suggestion of a history of ideas of knowledge. Um, ideas of or about knowledge, to be a little bit more precise. And I'll talk more about all of these things in turn and try to give you a sense of what I'm doing that might be different. So the history of knowledge has really emerged around study of forms, systems, institutions, discourses of knowledge, looking at, for instance, uh, the emergence of libraries as an institution of print as a form of the internet as a means of disseminating knowledge uh, at knowledge revolutions, knowledge economies. This is the kind of history of knowledge that's been told. And as a result of that focus on forms or, or uh, structures, cultures, we really lose a sense of individual agency. We have individuals subsumed into these big structures and, and cultures, uh, we don't have a focus on what people intend to do when they're building a library or when they are developing the internet as a system, just to give you two examples. We've lost what is really the characteristic focus of the history of political thought, um, at least in the contextualist tradition, the Cambridge School tradition, on utterances and aims. 
on how things are expressed and what's the meaning, what's the intention behind those expressions. But doing the history of knowledge in this way, focusing only on structures or cultures, means not only that we lose track of individuals and what they're trying to do, it, it means we actually are unable to tell, uh, to delimit the concept of knowledge, to really tell a coherent history of it. Uh, we lose a genealogy of that concept because we don't think about how it's conceptualized differently over time. And equally, we lose the relevance of that history to the present. Um, it's all very well to talk about analogies between knowledge revolutions in the past and present. But if we want to wage knowledge debates in the present, uh, debates over how much should Google be involved in education, um, we would do well to study knowledge debates in the past to try to recover resources from them. We can't do that unless we return to those debates in the terms in which they were actually waged. We actually go back to them and, and take them seriously in the terms that they were that they were fought out by people in the past. So I've talked so far about what I see as sort of the deficiencies of the history of knowledge um, that could be supplemented by integrating it with the history of political thought. Actually, I think this goes both ways because historians of political thought have not dealt really with knowledge uh, as a meaningful category, the way that the history of knowledge has taken on board. They've talked perhaps about the politics of certain branches of knowledge, not with actually that concept at large and the politics of that concept. They've not explored this concept's past meanings for political actors, which it turns out are very rich and worth considering. So what I propose is a history of ideas of knowledge, tracking the changing ideas of or about knowledge, not only what does knowledge mean, but how uh, by being invoked in political contexts, it changes meaning through being used and debated, hence of or about. And situate our own seemingly new politics of knowledge and historical perspective. That's the second benefit, I think, of this approach. Um, having a context for the debates of the moment and not thinking that they're entirely new and cannot be informed by the past. And indeed, recovering materials to use in these debates. It turns out that, as I'll get to in a minute, people debated the company's engagements with knowledge at a high degree of sophistication, with quite a lot of critical uh, tools that can be remembered and used in the present. We, we need these materials, and we ought to recover them. So this approach of the history of ideas of knowledge turns out to be particularly relevant, particularly useful when it comes to the East India Company. Because in fact, its engagements with knowledge have long been a topic of interest among historians, but their studies of these engagements have shown a lot of the same preoccupation with cultures and structures, and not with ideas, not with utterances and aims. Uh, some people in the room may know the names on this slide, and so I'll kind of say a bit about how actually I'm responding to these quite influential and quite different, and yet still in some way, cultural and structural approaches to that history of the company and its engagements with knowledge. The first of these approaches comes from a very early moment in the cultural turn, um, the beginnings of cultural history. We had with David Kopf an argument that the company's official orientation shifted from an, uh, an eastward-facing Orientalist orientation, this is before Edward Said's Orientalism, uh, taking on board knowledge from the East and trying to rule in accordance with it, to an Anglicist or westward-facing orientation defined by Macaulay's Minute on English Education. This is an early engagement with the company's engagements with knowledge, suggesting that the company use knowledge uh, for the practical business of governing, and it revealed the cultural formation of the company going through changes over the turn of the 19th century. But by the time of Said in the 1980s, you have a different kind of cultural and structural argument being made. This is that uh, knowledge is instrumental and it's part of, it's actually the same thing almost as power, indistinguishable from power. Those who've read uh, Michel Foucault know this argument well. Finally, in the 1990s, you have another argument being made that 
information, intelligence, knowledge, the terms are used interchangeably, simply was what it took to govern. And so it all gets kind of sucked up by the government of the East India Company in India, and it's all part of an information order. This, just like these other approaches, uh, yields many insights, and yet is at the same time um, ignoring the very things that I'm trying to focus on and pay most attention to. The actual debates being waged over knowledge, the actual terms in which those debates are happening. Studying those debates in their own terms, not only the context of debate, not only the external forms of debate, but the actual contents is really what my approach seeks to do and what you can see happening, I hope, in my book. I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through the argument of the book. I put this up here, but I think uh, I don't want to really weigh this down with uh, an excursive treatment of it. Um, but using this approach, I really show how the company's ideas about knowledge change dramatically. It starts off with patronizing scholars, both Indian and European, in the 1770s to kind of gain influence with influential elites on both sides of the company's empire, to trying to appeal to larger publics through the promise of mass education by the 1820s and 30s, just at a moment when the company's trade has dwindled and finally been uh, terminated, just at a moment when it's trying to prove it's good government to publics that are newly active in politics. And so it's this transformation from conciliation to mass education that defines the company's changing ideas about knowledge. And it's this transformation that I see is really crucial to understanding the company's changing engagements with knowledge, rather than a shift from a Orientalist to an Anglicist cultural formation, or a kind of continual, only superficially changing um, colonial knowledge, or even to a remaking of the information order. All of those previous arguments made very influentially over the past six decades. So to offer a few concluding reflections, maybe things we can talk about more, and getting back into the question of the East India Company's history and where it might go from here. Um, I would agree with Phil's point that really the company needs to be situated in a broader and a longer term context, rather than focusing only on the company as something of an aberration or uh, something to be studied only in its own um, isolated context. I think my work has pointed to the possibility of looking at it in the longer histories of what we would now call social corporate social responsibility. So thinking about how corporations actually have historically played a large role in everything from education to science to the humanities, how the state-led knowledge order that we now see as being challenged by corporations in all of these areas actually is no older than the 19th century. And the building of that order to happen had to overcome earlier uh, corporate-led um, patronage and support for, for all of those things, for science and education and humanities and publishing books and all the arenas of knowledge that we now associate with the state and see changing as a result of corporate encroachment. So that's the kind of longer term more global process that I think uh, a study of the company and its engagements with knowledge might um, il uh, illuminate and, and might uh, yield new possibilities for. And maybe at the broadest level, I think I've tried to show here how uh, the company, the state, and knowledge have all been malleable categories, have meant very different things, and hence their relations have been figured very differently. So to put that simply, you know, the role of corporations in knowledge, corporate knowledge, uh, might look one way today. It can be made to look very different in the future. Nothing is set in stone. So thanks very much, and I look forward to a fuller discussion. Thanks very much. Of course, I mean, what underlies all of that is that um, how, how you set about defining what it's worth finding out about and then what you do with it uh, are very complicated uh, processes because, I mean, I guess one could argue that um, 
uh, that, that human beings are naturally curious, but not all the things that they're curious about are worth knowing about or, or necessarily are, are, are very useful or are, or are very uh, helpful in understanding the human sort of predicament. So, um, I mean, in, in the book where you, where you go through, uh, you, you know, how the, the company, particularly during uh, the, Hastings, the Warren Hastings period, uh, makes serious efforts to try to uh, understand uh, Indian religion and Indian laws and so on, and, and how that persists even when you get to a stage in which uh, in the 19th century, uh, you, you're having a, a much more complicated mm. mixture of legal, uh, of, of legal and, uh, and intellectual uh, interchanges. But now, uh, Professor Finn uh, is sort of different from what we've just been hearing. One of the wonderful things about, um, about the East India Company at home is the way in which um, uh, th there is such a widening of the sorts of source material that you can use. Uh, very simply, a lot of, um, uh, of material uh, sources, I mean, pictures and objects and buildings and collections like we have in this, uh, like we have in this building, what, what they can tell us about uh, the influence of the, of the East India Company and, and what it does very, what her work is doing very vividly is showing how from a much earlier period than many of us would have guessed really, there is huge influence on British, particularly English society uh, that has sort of, it's crept in. It's just like I always used to explain very simply to students, you know, the greatest thing about multiculturalism is you should watch uh, Jamie Oliver on Channel 4 because that is how we know it's so English. We have Jewish food, Indian food, <laughs> Chinese food, uh, Italian food, and we're all much better for it, and we ought to remember that. So, Margot, would you like to bring, bring us back to some sort of solemnity after that and tell us about your work? Thanks, Gordon. While Matthew is doing the slides, I am going to thank both Gordon, Alison, Matthew himself for doing the slides. This is normally the part in a talk where somebody says, just wait till I start the PowerPoint. It's really nice to have someone else do it for me. So thanks very much um, for organizing this and um, having us, or to Josh really for organizing and to you for having us. Um, I do feel um, a bit of a charlatan, possibly a fraud, in that um, the two gentlemen to my right have nice new proper books whereas I have a very geriatric book, which was um, co-edited and co-authored with many others and came out in 2018. Um, so I'm not primarily going to be talking about the East India Home Company book, free to download from UCL Press, but you can also buy it in paperback for a mere 30 quid. Um, but I am going to take the methodology that we worked on there and use to talk about the book that I'm trying desperately to finish in the next year of sabbatical, which is described on your first slide. Uh, it's a monograph, a sole authored monograph called Imperial Family Formations, Dynastic Strategies and Colonial Power in British India from around 1757 to around uh, 87, so around the last century of company rule, but I range both backward and forward in time in ways that connect, I think, to some of the things we've been happening with. Um, the book is in three chunks of chapters. The first chunk is called People. The second chunk is called Property, which is the bit that most relates to the East India Company of Home book and, and methodology. And the third is called Politics. And in tonight's talk, because time is short, I'm gonna focus more on the people bit um, a little bit less on property and a little bit less on the, the politics bit, but we can come back to that if there's time at the end. The book really um, asks two main questions. 
The first is what happens if we add women to what we've just been hearing um, about. Um, women to what constitutes the state and what the state is for. Women about who does knowledge formation and what is knowledge formation about. Um, and if we add in material culture, add in the social in our analyses of the state. So I think I share with both of you this belief that the state really matters if we we're to understand what the East India Company is for and also how it does what it does. And then the second um, question, which is maybe a little bit different than what both of you are doing, is I think we have to think about how both British and Indian dynastic thinking and doing um, contested the so-called liberal imperialism that many historians argue was um, a dominant feature of British imperialism, particularly in the 19th century. And a part of what I'm trying to do is to contest that by looking at other forms that power took in the East India Company era. So I'm going to start by using Eliza Draper, nay Sclater, um, to begin that argument by looking at the ways in which company women, East India Company women, um, helped to reproduce East India Company power from a much earlier time period than I think we tend to think. You tend to get women being accounted for in British India, really in the Victorian era. They're thought about as being associated with the Raj. And one of the arguments that I have is that in the governing class, in the bits of the East India Company that particularly do the state work, um, uh, there are British women there much earlier than we thought. And I think they play a more foundational role than our history has tended to suggest. Sclater is just good to think with in this um, context. She's born in uh, 1744 in India itself to British parents. So that's significantly before Clive. Um, and a part of the argument is that there are more white, uh, that's in scare quotes, British women much earlier, and they are very reproductive. Um, her maternal and her paternal family lines are entrenched in the East India Company well before she is there. She and her two sisters are brought up because both parents die young, a very common thing to happen um, on the subcontinent to Britons. And so they're brought up by an extended family network. And thinking about those big, baggy Georgian and Victorian families, that do a lot of the work of the family, but then ultimately do quite a lot of work of the state is I think an important element to add in. Um, Eliza and her sisters having been shipped from India as children back home to Britain are then shipped back as early adolescents. Two of the three sisters are married by the age of 14 and they're uh, pregnant um, very, very shortly thereafter delivering their first child, uh, children up. Um, she is a self-described woman child. She leaves quite interesting uh, private letters and describes this phenomenon of the woman child married at 14. Um, uh, it turns out her marriage to Draper, who's a senior East India Company um, civil servant in the Bombay service, not very happy. At least one, quite possibly two of them are adulterous. The marriage does not end well. But again, that's pretty common in the East India Company family as well. It's also very common in the British family at the time. This is an age of big demographic boom. And that big demographic boom is both legitimate lawful children and illegitimate children as well, not only in India, but in Britain as well. That, to my mind, is one of the key reasons that investing in the East India Company makes sense. You've got large family cohorts that have to be propelled into the upper middle classes or kept there. And the East India Company is a magnificent way of doing it. I do not mean to say by saying all of this that I want to reduce these women to their wombs. They're very fruitful wombs. I do not. Eliza Draper was a, not only a, mar a marvelous letter writer, she was also the inspiration for Stern's sentimental journey. She's an enlightenment thinker in her own right. She's a knowledge producer. In, in um, Josh's terms, but nonetheless, uh, uh, discounting that reproductive role is, I think, a real problem. So I think that we can use not only her private writings or private letters, but also the material culture associated with her to um, uh, ferret her out in the, in the records, and also to explain better, to understand better, 
why these Georgians are in India and why they stick it out. They die like flies. A lot of them hate it. Why are they there? Well, a part of it is the material culture aspirations that they develop living there. You can see on the far left here, uh, Pam lived in the uh, desert for her husband. Big house in Bombay, looking out um, onto um, the bay. Um, and they also inhabit a number of country houses um, uh, in the southern portions of the Bombay presidency. They name them High Meadows. They give them those names of English country houses. And they develop a taste for it. And you can read about that in their letters, about oh, her sister has developed even higher class tastes than she has and may never be able to return from India because she will not be able to afford it. So I think the material culture is one of the driving forces. And that was one of the things that the free the downloads, only 30 pounds, East India Company at home, a uh, book that I'm not selling, um, tells us. But I think the material culture is also pragmatically really, really useful to us as historians, particularly as historians of women, because women occupy a really liminal, dropping out all the time place in the East India Company archive. And the company doesn't really want them there at a certain level, and it is very bad at counting them. And one of the reasons I think we think there are so few of them there is because the archive is frankly so crap. Now, um, one can decrapify the archive, I think, in part by looking at material culture. For example, when Eliza Draper dies, there's a wonderful statement, a memorial to her in the Bristol Cathedral, and that tells us she's 35 when she died and gives us a, um, a death. So we can calculate back when she was born. Working out when women are born is incredibly difficult in the 17th and 18th century. Nobody cares about them until they marry. Um, and as I'll explain in a moment, I think that's a real problem. One, it makes it easier for us to say they weren't there and they didn't really matter at all. But we can use material culture to capture a lot of them. Any of you who are familiar with a Bengal obituary, that wonderful um, compendium of memorials uh, from Bengal of the Britons who died there, that's a wonderful source for finding out when women were born because it's on the memorial when they bore, were born and when they died. So material culture figures pragmatically in this study. Turning here to another portrait, this is a famous portrait in, in Madrid of the Impies, Sir Elijah and Lady Impey, and another resounding example, sorry it's so fuzzy, of the fact that you have um, elite governing class women and they are very productive. These are three of their four Bengal-born children, um, uh, and they're there. Uh, uh, Lady Impey is, is uh, a major botanist and a collector of, of many things. Again, I'm not reducing her merely to these four children, but over a lifetime, she will bear nine legitimate children to her husband. Oxford Dictionary of National Biography will attribute seven to him and nine to her. This is another way in which the archive um, doesn't quite get it right. And we know that he had at least one, probably two illegitimate children with his English mistress before that. This is these big baggy families that require a lot of capital. Where do you go for a lot of capital? Well, the East India Company is a, is a very good place to do that. Now, Impey, I'm, I'm, I'm using here in part two, because if you read this portrait and the official record against the parish archives from Bengal, the thing that strikes you is that Impey is all over the baptismal records of the four children. He's always there, he's a stable referent, he's always Sir Elijah Impey, um, he's, he's um, uh, well referent. Whereas um, his wife Mary, she's there once as Mary, once as Elizabeth, once as Anne, and once as a gap in the record. So it's another example of how we need to be much more inventive, much more lateral, in order to write these women back um, into the archives um, of the East India Company. The material culture matters, I think, um, pragmatically. And um, uh, these big baggy families have economic needs, um, which are key uh, rationales described in private correspondence for why people stick it out in India. Um, and you can sometimes see that um, even when 
you'll have a couple literally at the Cape planning on going back to Britain and establishing themselves in Britain. And then it's discovered, oh, she's pregnant. And they decide, no, back to India and, and sort of um, handle um, a bit more of an East India Company fortune. Now, we know, obviously, from the work of Andrani Chatterjee and, and the work of um, Joseph Ghosh and others, how crucially important it was um, to these big, baggy British white uh, families uh, the labor, including the reproductive labor of Indian women, and I don't at all want to discount that. What I'm trying to do instead is to bring those stories by Chatterjee, by Ghosh, and by others together with the story I've just told you, and at some level together with the stories that Phil and Josh have been telling you there. Um, this case I've chosen not just because it's an amazing um, portrait in the net um, of an Aya, very, very rare for us to find those but also crucially, um, because when you dig back into the family whose children she accompanied um, home from Bengal to London, one of the first things that turns up is the fact that um, Deer, the military officer, family this was, was a captain when he married. Now, the, the argument in Ronald Hyam's work and in the work of others typically has been that military men only married if they were at the level of a major or above. Now that's I kind of that was a kind of a gauntlet thrown down as far as I was concerned because I'm really interested in truffling out um, these women and these children. Turned out when I did a statistical analysis, all of the ways that I could find as many children as possible, two things uh, became evident. One is that the baptismal register in the East India Company archive underestimate by I think at least twenty five percent the number of marriages and children. But secondly, statistically, the most likely military men to marry, lieutenants. Second most likely captain. It's not the senior men who are marrying. Marrying is a young woman. And again, marrying means that you're going to be, you're not killed, um, but you're going to stick it out because you've got all of these children. So um, I think using these um, material culture to capture some of these stories and then to think a little bit differently with them is I think a useful thing to do. Just two more slides to go, I promise, and then I will wrap up. Um, uh, this uh, picture at the left is uh, the three children who have to the baby who's in the arms of the China here. Two other children there. Uh, Lady Logan, Lena Lady Logan, um, born to an impecunious um, Scottish Highland family, married to an impecunious Scottish Highland husband, a surgeon in the company service. Um, she is one of the knowledge producers um, about North India, um, about uh, uh, Avad, about Lucknow in this period. And she's also a working mom um, uh, at the side of her husband, uh, recording and entering into the politics of um, the frontier and the politics of North India. Um, in this crucial um, era in the uh, late 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s. Um, and it's the two logins who become the guardians of Duleep Singh um, with the fall of the Sikh empire. So she's absolutely at the heart of courtly politics, dynastic politics, this politics, which I think partly because it tends to be a more female politics, we've written out of the stories of the three presidents. So a part of the state that I'm trying to reinscribe into our thinking about the state are these dynastic court circles and Lady Logan sitting next there to um, uh, Rajesh Indian, so the mother of Duleep Singh, um, with whom she resided in Kensington in the 50s and 60s before Rani Jindan died. Um, these women's stories, I think, also have to be braided into the co our conception of the company state. Um, and I think that's all I will say about um, that. I'm now going to wrap it up um, very, very briefly. Um, the book closes with a chapter called The Many Mansions of Duleep Singh, which explores the way in which I think family histories, material cultures, and stately homes, um, so coming back to the book that I'm not flogging tonight, um, can illuminate the tension between liberal imperialism and a dynastic rule. I mean, almost none of what I've been talking about so far fits neatly within the liberal imperialist paradigm that in many ways dominates the secondary literature 
of particularly the 19th Empire. And I think if it doesn't fit, if all of what I've just said doesn't fit, maybe the paradigm needs some adjustment. But that's one of the key arguments that I'm trying to make there. Um, I think the second one is, um, and this particular chapter uses Duleep Singh to try and make this argument, I think we gain a really impoverished view of colonial and imperialist processes in British India um, if we write out or write off the presence and the functions, and I want to emphasize the functionality of the families, including the women and children, when we conceive of the company state and when we try and get our heads around its really wild politics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I mean, it, again, that sort of suggests, uh, as against the stereotype views, that uh, that the East India Company state or the East India Company uh, in India is a is uh, interestingly much more integrated than some of the other stories would would suggest, or some of the basic narratives uh, would would suggest. Um, and that, of course, um, is a good way of making much more plausible uh, the successes and the failures of the of, of, of the regime and, and of these constant debates about the need to uh, to reform and to change and to what are we doing here. Whereas, of course, it's perfectly reasonable to think all these people should be there uh, as part of the of that upper class or that ruling of a species of elite. I mean, now I think what's going to happen is Matt is going to Matt is going to move some chairs about and set us up for our discussion in the in the room. Yeah, just bear with me. I'm going to just switch things over a little bit. Um, I think actually we keep it here if yeah, everyone's okay, okay with that. I think that would work quite yeah, well. Okay, uh, I'll move your chair over. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, then I'll set up the microphones as well. Just bear with me a second. I just need to uh, do some boring technical things. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, there's one. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> so how would you like to begin? <laughs> I ask you. I mean, we've had such rich offerings here because I mean, uh, the um, it, it's oversimplified, or, or it's a bit of a cop out just to say uh, what you've all shown is everything is much more complicated mm -hmm. than any uh, historical argument uh, suggests. And that the fact that one's introducing new arguments doesn't mean that some of the old arguments don't continue to, uh, uh, to survive. Um, but I think what, uh, what, all, or, or what all of your work uh, does suggest is is that um, we've got to get a, we've got to get away from thinking of uh, of imperialism as just some sort of expansion of Europe or or something that is driven by the European economy or European politics or European sort of state building. Uh, because that's 
not really what it's about at all. I mean, what it's what it's about is 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 these interactions that the company would not have worked had it not become so integrated in the uh, the trading patterns and the political uh, structures uh, of South Asia and 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 further east. And the places where it was not successful were, were where it failed to uh, where it failed to do that. And that it it involved creating alliances uh, with or partnerships with um, uh, dynamics that are inherent in Asia in Asia itself, and so it it, it makes it makes it uh, feasible to think of of people, um, although they might think of, of England as home. They they are really at home also uh, in in Asia. I'll, I'll, since I have the microphone, I'll start. What I really picked up from listening to myself, and more so to Phil and Margot, was the incredible variety of different places that company politics happened. Um, not only uh, in corporate and state institutions, but in places like the university and uh, the scientific expedition, and finally to the family and the, the dynastic structure. And it's through that proliferation of sites of politics that expansion, the story of expansion can be told, not simply the expansion of the state. That's one initial thought that I had listening to you as well, Gordon. Yeah, I, I would just add, uh, I have a. I wish I'd gone last. I would have changed everything I said. So there's a number of ways in which I think all of this work intersects, and I might say something about that in a second. But I wanted to speak to your point because I think, Gordon, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that a lot of these histories show that this is not just a singular, unidirectional kind of history. But I would also want to add that it's that the East India Company, at least from my perspective, while it is dependent upon and is its history is critically engaged with and integrated into, say, Mughal or other forms of sovereignty in Asia. It also, by virtue of being this peculiar assemblage of a European corporation, transforms those state, you know, so it's not simply just embedding itself in these networks. So the example that comes to mind is um is my the after uh 1765, the, you know, the East India Company essentially uh, you know, acquires its uh, form of sovereignty in Bengal. And uh, Ghulam Hussein Khan, the Bihari historian, looks at this and says, well, you know, it is kind of taken on this Mughal form of sovereignty, but what is this thing? It's not a, you know, basically says, it's as if Bengal has no ruler at all because it's all of these people. It's this corporation. I mean, it doesn't say, it's per, say but that, that we're, it's not a hereditary body. It's not um, anything that we're familiar with. And they, in fact, not only that, it keeps changing the rulers. There's some new governor comes out every two years. They, they're all fighting with each other all the time. This is not a government, right? So so the, 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 there's a way in which the East India Company um, operates through Mughal forms of sovereignty as a way of acquiring power, but also because of its, institu its specific institutional formation, uh, transforms it as well. And that's kind of the character of what this British empire is. It's distinct from what came before it, I think. Don't you think though that, um, that there, there's some sort of common, I mean, you, you, you were talking about mogul forms of sovereignty. Are they so very different from European forms of sovereignty? No, no, yeah. no, no, no. That, that, you know, I, I mean, one of the things that you've shown is, is how sovereignty is not a, um, 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 a monolithic thing. I mean, it is layered. It, it, it involves you know. Oh no! And exactly. And growing. Uh, and this is what makes it possible for the things to become to become yeah. a colonial government. But it's also in the differences in what makes for a ruler that allows for the transformation. Well, but I was thinking about this when listening to to Josh too, because I think that what you're pointing at is also maybe moving beyond. Uh, histories of um, what used to be called, I think, competition or collaboration or something like that. Moving beyond the, you mentioned Cone, for example, and moving, you know, thinking that what I find with the East India Company, when I look at the East India Company, is I find neither complete translation or complete miscognition, right? What you find is a, a recognition of the familiar, but oftentimes just a little off 
you know, mm -hmm. off speed, like listening to a record at the wrong, oh, that's a dated reference, isn't it? Um, uh, that, that or, or, or what you might think about as actually translation, right? The act of translation, which is a conceptual act that often does some violence to the original. And so you have great similarities, but it's in those, those differences that you also see the nature of power sort of exert itself. Margot, I mean, how, how do you, the, the sort of families that you were talking about, um, how do they maintain their connections with, uh, with Leadenhall Street and, and, and the counties in Scotland and, and, and so on? I mean, uh, uh, is there a continuing uh, quite powerful exchange of, of you know, letters, information, ideas? Yes, and if I could just, um, before I get to that, yeah. which is an extra question, just um, tag on to what Phil just said. I mean, I think one of the reasons that the family, both as a household unit um, through to family as dynasty is good to think with in India. And you could see it, I didn't really discuss my first slide, which is one of the many, many deathbed scenes of Tipu Sultan with a couple of the wives and various of the sons there. That fascination, a continuous fascination, as not just with Tipu, but with others, about how many wives do they have? Which is the legitimate son that comes back again and again and again with Ranjit Singh? It comes back, it comes back, you know, all over the piece. And it's partly because the family is so damn familiar. You know, everyone has one, and the company is a very patriarchal affair. Um, so they're trying to map something that's very different and yet is blindingly similar mm. onto um, how politics works in India while thinking about, well, how does politics work in Britain? And if you think particularly in the Georgian era of how incredibly disorderly um, the royal family is in Britain, I mean, you know, it, 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 it matches. Yeah, yeah. It, it matches very, very neatly. Yeah. Um, so I think the family is something that is continuously thought with in political terms, both in Britain and in India, is worth thinking about. So how do they stay in, in touch? Uh, private letters all over the place. And these, um, I think, haven't been not mined enough. Um, and they are incredibly rich, incredibly detailed and often mention people who aren't in the um, official record, which is always very useful. The circulation of material objects is really important, um, and they can be enormous. Um, I showed you the Eliza Draper um, a Bacon Memorial, which is in Bristol Cathedral. Um, my favorite memorial stone is the memorial to the first um, deceased wife of Henry Russell, who was the Hyderabad resident. And he commissions Bacon the Elder, I think it's the Elder, no, it's probably Bacon the Younger, um, to do a huge memorial scene to this first wife who dies, I think at the age of 18, um, a couple of months after their marriage. Um, and it is her deathbed scene is commissioned and sculpted. And it sinks when the Elizabeth sinks off the French coast. So he commissions the second one which is the one that's now in the Madras um, Cathedral. So one of the ways in which you communicate with people is through portraits and the circulation, and you can sometimes track them being circulated among male family members in India before they're sent home to family um, in Britain. So um, material objects and their circulation, whether it's shawls or portraits or memorial objects, together with these private letters are the main foci of what I'm looking at. But a surprising number of comments about family members, including even women, pop up in official military correspondence. So they're all over the place. And and of course the uh, the object, I mean the, the shawls and the, I mean the way in which English taste is is changed in I mean not, not changed, I mean develops in, in the 18th century. So that these appear to be perfectly normal mm. things in you know, in in English uh, in in English country life. We'll have William give us a good give us a good comment. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'd really like to just ask two very quick questions. First, of Professor Stern and Alec. You talk about this sort of expansion of the corporate institutional model, uh, much wider than the East India Company, and even after the East India Company is, uh, has uh, theoretically lapsed. Uh, you never mentioned you never mentioned the United States of America at all. Yet 
it seems to me that everything that you say must apply in in great measure to the United States of America. So my question is, are you rewriting American history as well? <laughs> the, the other brief question to Margaret is that uh, uh, you talk about the Bacon Senior Memorials and the, the Bacon Memorial to Sir William Jones in St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, has this anonymous Indian female draped across his feet uh, is not explained by any of the uh, artists who've, uh, who've uh, re deconstructed this uh, as to who she is. And, and I wonder how she fits into your sort of perception of the woman in the Indian in the British Empire in India. I think this is really a question for Phil. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> no, they um no, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's what when I started the you know, my talk, I said it felt a little awkward. You now I started my career work on the East India Company. I feel like it's where I went home. It's a, also like that um uh that line from The Godfather, like what you think you're out, he just keeps just keeps pulling you back in. I tried to write a book that was about America and it ended up being half about the East India Company. But the other half of this book is very much about the corporate origins of the American colonies. Uh, and and how they uh, uh, and I, can, I keep going about this, but we are at the Royal Asiatic Society, so I'll, I'll limit myself. But not only um, in the ways in which the East India Company is connected to those Atlantic histories, but the ways in which the corporation figured in American colonial enterprise from the 16th century through to the American Revolution, and arguments about the ways and why I have a, a a bunch in there, not as much as I would have liked, about how the the uh, debates over the American Revolution were in part debates about the whether the the American colonies were corporate in their constitution and what that meant for them to be corporations. Because the thing about corporations is sort of as a tangent from that is that, I mean, I say in the book, you know, I get asked a lot, well, give me a, a definition. What is a corporation? And the truth is I can give you a certain kind of explanation, but the truth is the argument that I make in the book is the corporation is 400 years, a debate. An argument about what it actually is. Is it subordinate to the state? Is it equal to the state? Is the state itself a form of corporation? Is it produced by the state or is it produced by the people who come together to make it and only later, you know, given some kind of you know status by the state? And these are the debates at the core of the American Revolution of what exactly is the constitution of these colonies and their relationship to the British Empire. So it's very much. Uh, I don't say I'm re rewriting American history, but I'm I'm feebly intervening in thinking about the uh, you know the ways in which American colonization is part of the story as well. So tell us about Sir William Jones and the lady. Yeah, the Jones Memorial, if you've not seen it, is definitely worth a, a view. And you're right; it has a, a you know draped uh, Indian a woman at the foot. I think there are two possible interpretations one could have of that. One is, is she a bibi? You know, is she a concubine that we don't know about? Um, I suspect um, that's not the case, though, um, in that particular instance, though you may recall from the Joanna de Silva um, Aya portrait that I showed you there, in the text under that slide, I point out that the in the uh, baptismal register of his first legitimate daughter, directly under it is the baptism on the same day at the same place of his illegitimate daughter by an Indian woman. So these are these are very much complex families of that sort. It's perfectly possible Jones um, uh, was of that um, uh, practice as well, uh, though I don't know that of him. I think more likely is it's an image about um, Jones and Sati and British abolition to Sati with a revelation. Um, and I, part of what I do in the book is to try and unpick that dominant narrative about what happened with the East India Company um, and its uh, uh, efforts to modernize, and I'm just gonna use modernize very broadly there, um, uh, Hindu society um, is, oh, well, there's the abolition of Sati. Um, one of the things I do in one of the chapters of the book is look at, okay, once you abolish sati, not that it gets abolished, um, uh, from the 1830s, what happens to rajas who die without a male heir? And what happens, of course, is that their ranis, with great abandon and great joy, supported by their menfolk, um, persistently adopt the wrong child. 
um, and it creates enormous tension. And it's often residents in royal courts are often quite complicit in the process. So there's a politics of progeny or the lack of progeny that we see there that flows out of the abolition of sati question. So I, I suspect that that may well be why the, why the languishing woman um, is at the bottom of Jones's is statue. But there's probably somebody in this room, given the um, composition of the room, who actually knows the answer. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I'm I'm going to be a bit of a spoil sport now because I I notice how the time has has fled, and uh, and I think we must thank all three of you for uh, for wonderful uh, individual presentations. But I hope the main point has got across to uh, to our readers and to our fellows and to those on Zoom that actually this is a very exciting moment in historiography of, uh, of Britain's relationship with India and India's relationship with, with Britain. Uh, and it's one that we should be very proud of and we should encourage in all strength to your elbows or perhaps to your brains to, uh, to, uh, to, to take us on further. Those of you who are in the room are in a privileged position because you will have uh, an opportunity now to uh, nab your favorite speaker or the speaker that you think has said the worst possible thing and put them right before we carry them off to dinner. Thank you very much indeed.